Hey guys, welcome back to Control System Laboratories. In the last few videos, we spent some time discussing how to read a gyro datasheet. In this video, we're going to put all that information to good use to develop a simple MEMS gyro model in MATLAB and Simulink. This model can be used to test out your linear control system design in a non-linear simulated environment, which is handy in case you want to tweak some control parameters without having to load new software onto your device and test it physically over and over again. Also, we can linearize this nonlinear model to develop our control law and check for stability as well. So let's get to it. You can see that I'm using version 2013A of MATLAB. But don't worry if you don't have access to this version, because everything that I'm going to show you is available at least as far back as 2010A and possibly even further. Also, I have the full version of MATLAB, but the same functions that I'm using here are part of the student package as well. Now we're going to build up our model in Simulink, so let's open up the Simulink library browser and create a new model. Now at the fundamental level, the input into our MIMS gyro is real-world angular rate, and the output is counts, or some value that can be represented by a 16-bit integer. So I'm going to temporarily add an input and an output to the model, just so that we remember what these signals are. I'll replace them later so that we can run the model. The absolute simplest conversion between angular rate and counts is just a simple gain, whose value is the conversion factor between the two. And we can get the value of the gain directly from the datasheet. It's called sensitivity in this datasheet. And I want to model the gyro with a full scale of 250 degrees per second, therefore the gain would be 8.75 milli degrees per second per digit, or per count. We can set our gain to that by double clicking on the gain and writing in 1 divided by 0 0.00875 so that we can convert from degrees per second to counts. This is a pretty boring model so far, and not all that accurate if you compare it to the real gyro. And one of the reasons for this is that there is a dynamic aspect to the gyro. A MIMS gyro has a small vibrating mass, and when you rotate the gyro, that mass experiences a small Coriolis force, which displaces the vibrating mass from its original path. The gyro uses capacitance to sense this displacement and output a proportional number of counts. And if you watched my video on system identification where I violently shook a spring, you can picture how a spring mass system is governed by a second order equation. And the spring mass in this gyro is exactly the same. If we rotated the gyro back and forth, faster than the natural frequency, then the output will experience a drop in gain and some phase lag. Luckily for us, the natural frequency is generally very high, somewhere in the kilohertz range, so it's usually out of the way for most applications. Now I've just added a generic second order transfer function in line between the input and the scale factor to account for these dynamics. But we also know from reading the datasheet that this gyro, and all sensors in general, are subjected to a static bias and sensor noise. The static bias is the average output when the gyro is not rotating, so we can just add a constant value to our input. The noise will be modeled as a band-limited white noise, which means that the noise is going to have equal power at all frequencies. This is pretty close to how real noise exists on the MIMS gyro. And what I mean by this is that there isn't like a 60 Hz noise signal that's more powerful than any other signal. All frequencies exist at equal power and make the signal, well, noisy. If you open up the band-limited white noise block, you'll see three things that you need to input. The sample time needs to be the sample time of our gyro, which is 1 divided by 95 seconds, or running at 95 hertz. The seed is just a number that sets the random number generator, so you don't have to worry about that for right now. Whatever the default is will be fine. We can get the number for the amount of noise in our system directly from the datasheet. It's usually called angle random walk or rate noise density. Here it's rate noise density, and it was calculated using a fast Fourier transform. You can tell by the units. You can check out my videos on reading gyro datasheets to learn the different ways that noise is presented. But to go from a fast Fourier transform version of rate noise density into noise power, you just have to square that value. So for noise power, it'd be 0 0.03 squared. Now we're starting to get a pretty good gyro model. But we need to add a saturation block before the output because the gyro can't output at an infinite rate. 
There's only 16 bits of data, and so no matter what the input rate is, we know that the output's not going to be greater than a 16-bit number. And at this point, this is a pretty good simple model of a generic MIMS gyro. But I want to add one more thing to it. This gyro has the option for a built-in low-pass filter, and you can select the cutoff frequency by setting a certain register in the gyro. And I chose 95 Hz output data rate with a 12.5 Hz cutoff frequency for my low-pass filter. Now I don't know exactly how the low-pass filter is set up in the gyro, but I'm going to approximate it as a second-order filter with a cutoff at 12.5 Hz. Also, this is a digital filter, which means Z-domain. But I'm going to model it in the S-domain since the rest of the model is S-domain, and also because the difference between the two is really small in the frequencies where I'm going to be operating my gyro. Now I screwed up here in two ways. First, I placed the low-pass filter after the saturation block, which means now I could potentially get values larger than 16 bits. So I should have placed the saturation block last. And second, the output is a data type of double in this model, and the real gyro would only output a signed integer. So to make this complete, I should have added a block to the end that converts the value into a signed integer. But neither of those mistakes will really affect the rest of the video. Before we run this model, let's collect some real gyro data and see what it looks like. I've already connected the gyro to my Arduino and attached it to the computer through the USB cable. And I've written this simple sketch that's going to read the z-axis of the gyro at 95 Hz and write the value to the serial port. Now there are two things I want to point out with this sketch. First, I've set the baud rate of the serial port to 115200 so that the rate is fast enough to send all of my data. And second, I'm writing to the gyro register here to set it to 95 Hertz with a low pass filter with a cutoff of 12.5 Hertz. So now I can just compile and upload this to the Arduino. Once that's done, you can check to see that everything is operating okay by bringing up the serial monitor. You should see a bunch of numbers streaming by really quickly. But we're going to capture this output in MATLAB and not here, so we're going to close the serial monitor. I've written a simple script in MATLAB to read data off the serial bus and save the information in a variable called real gyro data. You can find out what the name of the serial port that you're using is by going back to the Arduino program and finding serial port. Just place that name in the serial function at the top and set the baud rate to match what the Arduino is sending. In our case, it's 115200. I'll run this script and wait the three minutes while it collects data. Of course, I edited out the wait for this video, so three minutes has passed already. Now you can see that we have our data, so let's create a time vector to go along with it. We know we started at time zero and took a measurement every 95 hertz, and we have 17,100 samples. So we'll plot the time history of the real gyro output to see what it looks like. Not only is there an obvious bias around minus 80 counts, but there's a fair amount of noise on the signal too. Remember that the gyro was just sitting on a table during this, not rotating at all. So if this was a perfect sensor, you would expect it to be zero for all three minutes, and not this fuzzy looking line. But this behavior is exactly the reason why we added a bias and noise block to our model. We can find the bias by getting the mean value for the signal. It looks like it's actually closer to minus 78 counts. But we modeled bias as degrees per second, so we need to convert this first before placing it in the model. And that's minus 0.6851 degrees per second. Let's add that static bias value to our model now. And I'll create a new signal with this bias removed so that we can check the frequency content of just the noise. We're going to run a fast Fourier transform on this variable real gyro no bias. And I've written my own simple FFT script, but it still uses the built-in FFT MATLAB function. So you can just use that function or any other method that you're comfortable with to generate the frequency content. I'll grab the header here so that I know how to call the function, and I'll replace the sample time with 1 divided by 95 seconds, and the data with that signal I just created called real gyro no bias. Of course, first convert it into degrees per second. I'll run that and the frequency content will pop up. And check this out. The amplitude of the noise is just about constant for all of the low frequencies, just like you would expect from white noise. 
and they're constant up until around 12.5 Hz, where it starts to fall off quickly. You'll remember that we've added this low pass filter with a cutoff of 12.5 Hz, so everything is working as expected. Now to find the rate noise density, I'm going to use the Allen variance of the signal. What the Allen variance is, is a whole other video, but I've left links in the description below if you'd like to learn more. The bottom line though is that I can pick off the rate noise density directly from the Allen variance plot by looking at the value of tau equals one second. This will make a little bit more sense with an example. You can see here that I wrote an Allen variance script for myself, but there's one that you can download directly from MATLAB if you'd like. Again, the link is below. Now I'll run the Allen variance for the no bias data in degrees and see what it looks like. In this Allen variance plot that just popped up, tau is the x-axis, and so the value where tau equals 1 lies somewhere between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 1 for Allen variance. We can get the exact value at the command window. The 95th entry for tau is 1 second, so that's what we want. You can see that tau of 96 is just past 1 second. Therefore, the Allen variance at 1 second is just the 95th entry in AVAR or the rate noise density is 0 0.0375 degrees per second per square root of hertz. And if we compare that number to the data sheet, you can see that they actually match really well. So I'm going to update the noise power in our model to reflect this real value. And I'll set the natural frequency of the gyrodynamics to 1000 hertz, which honestly is probably still too low, but I have no idea what it really is and I'll set the cutoff frequency of our low-pass filter to 12.5 Hz. Also, I'll estimate the damping ratio for both to be about the square root of 2 over 2. Again, I don't really know what the damping ratio would be, I just want it to be more than 0.5 so that there's no resonance in the filter. And now we only have to replace the input with a constant of 0, since the gyro is not rotating on my table, and replace the output in our model with a sync to the workspace so that we have access to the data. The last thing we need to do is set the model to run for 3 minutes at a fixed 95 hertz or a sample time of 1 divided by 95 seconds. And we can hit the play button to run it. And back at the command window, we now have our simulated gyro data that we can compare with the real gyro data to see how well our model does. But it looks like we ran our model for one frame longer than the real gyro. So I'm going to remove that last frame so that we have a good one-to-one -one comparison. I'll plot both the real and simulated gyro on the same time domain plot to see how they match up. You can see that we've matched the bias really well. And the noise also looks about right, but it's really hard to tell in the time domain. So let's check it out in the frequency domain. First we need to remove the bias from the simulated data, just like we did before. Then I'll plot the FFT of the real gyro data and change the color to red so that we can distinguish it from the simulated data. Then if I hold the plot so that I don't overwrite the data, I can plot the FFT of the simulated gyro right on top. And check this out. The frequency domain information matches just as well as the time domain information did. At the low frequencies, the noise amplitude is constant and at the same level as the real gyro data. We even managed to match the slope of the roll-off after 12.5 Hz perfectly, which I think is pretty awesome. So there you have it, a simple model that does a pretty good job of matching the real physical gyro. Of course we can add a lot more complexity to this model like bias instability and misalignments, and we will in the future, but for now this is all we need to proceed with our system design for the robotic car. Before I sign off here, let me quickly show you how you can linearize this model so that you can use it to design and analyze your closed loop control system. I'll set up a typical closed loop control system with a reference, a controller, and a plant. And we'll feed back the output using our sensor. Now if we didn't have a model of our sensor, we might be tempted just to use Unity feedback. But now we can place a linear sensor model in the feedback path to make it more accurate. First, though, we need to get rid of the gyrodynamics. Since this is so high frequency, it's completely trumped by the low frequency low pass filter later on. Also, we can assume that we've calibrated our gyro, so there's no static bias. 
and we can also remove the white noise since it's nonlinear and the mean value of it is zero. Also, we can remove the saturation block since it's not linear, and we're going to assume that we're going to operate the gyro within the full scale that we've chosen. And lastly, the scaling factor converts from degrees per second to counts. But when you implement this in your system, you don't care about counts. So you're going to add another conversion in software to convert back to degrees per second. These two conversions will cancel each other out, and all we'll be left with is the low-pass filter. So to model the gyro, we'll use the full-up nonlinear model. But to analyze the linear control loop, all we need to do is add the low-pass filter in the feedback path. And that is our linearized model of our gyro. Now I know that this was a long video, but I hope you found some value in it. In the next laboratory video, we're going to use the gyro to help us derive a transfer function for our robotic car in a process called system identification. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and thanks for watching.